Okay. Hopefully some of the audio issues might be taken care of this time as far as the buzzing and such. I did a, a, a recording earlier after making some adjustments. And um, although my voice was coming a little lower volume than I would have liked, uh, it sounded okay otherwise. So hopefully this will work for everybody or work a little bit better this time than it did, uh, than it did last time. So with that, let's go ahead and take a look at what we've got going on here. Okay, so I've got a ColecoVision that's been sent in that's going to be getting a lot of services. But uh, I've done some preliminary diagnostic testing on it, and for the most part, it's in good shape uh, as far as functionally. Both of the control ports are working well. However, as a preventive measure, I uh, will talk to the owner, but I'm thinking about installing a pair of these. These are ESD protection boards for the controller ports. Uh, these are actually designed and made by Ruggers Customs. Jimmy over there is a great guy. He does. Uh, he actually specializes in the ColecoVision and pretty much uh, does a whole lot of ColecoVision stuff. But uh, yeah, he designed up these boards. Now, I, he primarily designed them, I think, initially for the ColecoVision. But technically, these can be used on almost any system that uses a 9-pin connector set up for their controllers. And long story short, what these do is, is you solder these on top of the pins for the controller for the controller ports on the bottom of the PCB. And they have diodes in place that will essentially direct any large static discharge that might come from plugging and disconnecting controllers through the controller ports uh, to ground. Essentially, the diodes here block the uh, high voltage from going anywhere dangerous in the system and just forces everything to the ground. So... That's, that's pretty much what they're for, and um, yeah, so I'm going to talk to the owner about putting a pair of these on, but that's not what we're going to focus on tonight. Um, instead, we're going to focus on this controller. Now, I've already checked out this controller a little bit, and for the most part, it is working. Um, the left side fire button here is very, very intermittent. If I push really hard and quick, I can get response out of it briefly. So at least I know it can work, and that's a very good sign. On the directional controls, the up and right are sluggish. I can get them to work sometimes, but you kind of have to hold them at just the right angle and you know, with your, you know, and just kind of squint properly to get them to work. However, the left and down seem to work really well. Uh, also, the keypad buttons appear to be functioning just fine also. So, primarily what I'll need to focus on to get this controller working again, aside from cleaning it up a little bit later, but that'll be a later project, uh, is to get this left side fire button working adequately and properly, as well as making sure all of the directional controls respond far better than they are now, especially the up and right direction. So, uh, yeah, let me go ahead and uh, just, uh, I'm going to power this on again real quick. Now, you won't be able to see what I'm doing. I have it connected up via RF to a uh, TV off to the side. And I have an Atari Max cartridge in here. Oh, actually I forgot I actually had it up on, on something earlier. Let me power this back off. Turn it back on. Power switch needs to be cleaned up and uh, possibly rebuilt as well on this. All right, so let me go to my system test. Go to the Atari Max console diagnostics and go to the controller test. And yeah, up is, it, it registers, but it doesn't stay. And I kind of have to hold it at an angle. Same thing for right. Left is working good. Down's working good. Yeah, there, I can just, if I really push it hard and quick, I can sometimes get the left fire button to register, but not always. Right fire button seems to work all the time, but the same thing I'm going to do to get this button working again, I'm going to go ahead and apply over here as well, just for a preventive measure. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, asterisk, zero, and pound. So all of the keypad buttons are working just fine on this controller as well. So that's, that's good. So again, to rehash, I just need to focus on this left side fire button and the up and right directions. But all of the directions and everything is going to get looked at. And, uh, and when I go to refurbish the controller, well, you'll see how I do this. Uh, for those that might be curious, this ColecoVision is actually being powered using one of the Cole USB adapters that in turn uses a USB-C power cord that actually plugs into a, um, a tablet charging 
charger or basically like a phone charger. But uh, for right now, I'm not going to need any of this because we're going to go ahead and clear this up because all we need is the controller. So let me get my cold USB disconnected. Very important with the cold USB device if you're not actually going to be using it for a while. Uh, definitely unplug it from the console and unplug your power cord that you have running into it as well. They will get hot, and if you forget to disconnect them, uh, there is a possibility of the cold USB overheating and burning out. Uh, this is my second cold USB because that's exactly what happened to my first one. Go ahead and get the controller disconnected, and we'll get the rest of the get my RF cable disconnected. And we'll put the console away and just focus on the controller. ColecoVision controllers are not too difficult to take apart. There's four screws initially to actually get the controller apart to at least get into the inside of it. But technically there's five screws that need to be removed to really be able to work on it. Uh, all of the screws are the same size and type. The, you can use a number two Phillips like I am here to remove them, although a number one might fit a little bit better. So the four screws that I just removed in the upper corners and right here almost in the center, that's enough for the actual shell to be taken apart. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and just get this cord kind of out of my way a little bit. Now it can be kind of scary when you go to pop these loose because you do have to kind of bend them back enough that they crack. And that's just these catches on the end. It's going to be kind of hard to see, but right along here, snap in and hold on to the base of the controller. So let me set that off to the side. Here's the keypad and the rest of the keyboard and a PCB. Side fire buttons. The fifth screw is also accessible from the bottom of the controller housing, and it's basically top center. And it is essentially holding in place, it is holding down this round uh, cross-shaped disc. And this plastic actuator disc is what the actual controller itself there's this big, large, flat piece of plastic that the controller handle is, is attached to, along with a fairly beefy spring. That's what pushes down on the edges of these little points on the end of this disc. And it pushes down on these tiny little leaf switches that actually activate the controls. Underneath each leaf switch is basically a small rivet that goes through the board that is attached to traces on the other side. And that's how it knows what, what's been pushed. Uh, if you've ever taken apart one of the ColecoVision tabletop arcades that used to exist in the 80s, they use the exact same leaf switches. Exact same. No different. So I'm stating that because the repair you see me go through here for this controller to refurbish it and get these directions working again can also be used on those arcade tabletops if you have one that's got a direction or two that's also not working properly. Okay, so after I remove that screw here, that will allow the entire housing to now lift up. It was actually screwed into the bottom of this disc on top. Now, I still have all the cables and such attached. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to go ahead and leave that in place because for what I'm going to do, I don't need to completely remove everything. I'm also not going to bother with removing the keypad out of the uh, ZIF socket here because honestly, it can be kind of tricky to get this back in there. It's really low profile, really close to the PCB, and... Uh, the mylar on this is it's old, you know, it's 40 years old. It doesn't take to bending around too much more. So, you know, the less you have to mess with this, the better. So I'm just going to leave it attached. But what I am going to do is go ahead and pop these buttons off the side of the fire button switches. Okay. And the really cool thing about these switches is that they're really strong spring loaded. They're actually really good quality switches. And they've got these openings on the top of them. And those openings are very important because all we really need to do to fix these, because the switch does activate if I push down, on, push down on it hard and quickly, I at least know that it's able to make connection. The reason why it's not working consistently is simply because there's a lot of corrosion and buildup inside of the switch. So all we need to do to fix this is we just need to spray liberally some uh, good quality contact cleaner 
into these switches and work them back and forth quite a few times just to, to work loose any of that corrosion and stuff and essentially clean up the contacts inside of the switch itself. So that's all we're going to have to do on that. And then I'm going to get this white disc popped off of here by pushing on the bottom side of the PCB. But you got to be careful because the PCBs on these are old. They're also somewhat thin and have some flexibility to them. And it is very easy to crack these PCBs if you put too much stress on them when trying to work on these controllers. So do be mindful of that. There we go. So I was just using my thumbnails here to just kind of hold on to it steady but not bend it and push down into the center of the disc to pop it off. So the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and spray out those fire buttons. So let me just kind of, I'm going to get an old shirt or an old cloth or something here just to kind of get to minimize my mess a little bit. There we go. Like I said, spray it liberally. Do not be afraid to use it. And then we're going to actuate these switches back and forth a couple of times. And even though this one here was working already, it does not hurt to go ahead and spray some cleaner in it also, just, just to make sure. See, I have some other contact cleaner over here that I will sometimes also spray into it to use. This is my big stuff, my Puretronics. Let's see, where's my, hey, I don't have a nozzle on this. That's okay, I will borrow the nozzle from my other one. Because they are all fairly uniform in size. There we go. I've only, I think I've only ever had to actually replace one of these switches completely, like desolder it from the PCB and replace it with a different one, maybe twice ever. Most of the time, just hitting it up with some good contact cleaner like I just did is all you need to do to get these working again for quite some time. Obviously, eventually in time, this will need to be done again, but I did this with my original ColecoVision controllers uh, probably well over 10 years ago, and I haven't, had to I haven't had to spray them since, so they've been working pretty well. I'm sure environment, how you know the console was cared for in its life, things like that matters as well. Just clean up some of the extra residue. So while I've got that going, so now let's talk about these leaf spring switches. So... It's pretty obvious what the problem is. Even though the spring itself is in good shape, it's not cracked or broken, which is something to check, uh, it's just not making very good consistent contact with the little rivet that's underneath it. And if I turn the board over here, you can kind of see uh, there, the rivets are essentially in the centers here. Okay. Actually, interesting. Okay. Yep, they're soldered down into place. I don't see any broken traces or anything on the board, so... But again, the controls do work, they're just not consistent. So I know that I don't have any broken traces to deal with. But how do I get around this? How do I clean this up? What do we need to do? Well, I'm actually going to undo one side of each of these leaf springs. So all I need to do is get some solder, get my iron. And I'm going to apply some fresh solder. to one pad on each of the springs. Doesn't really matter which one. Now what I'm doing is I'm just putting the iron on it and pushing down on that one side of the spring, like that, that switch. Now I'm going to get my desoldering, iron, uh, desoldering gun. Sounds like it might need to be cleaned up a little bit. Okay. 
Now by removing the solder on one side, I can now carefully pop these up. Just on the one side. And then carefully bend them up vertically so I have full access to the little rivet contacts underneath them. You can just kind of see that. Located here, 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 and here. So what I do to get this going, get these working, is I get a fiberglass pencil and I'm going to get my little Hey, it's the holidays, so let me get my little festive plate. And I'm going to get this plate and I'm going to put it here. Now, this plate's purpose is for one thing and one thing only, and that is to uh catch the fiberglass here. Now, I'm just going to get this fiberglass pencil. And I'm just going to go over these rivets over the top of them. Now, what I'm doing is I'm getting rid of any surface corrosion that was on them and also roughening up the surface at the same time and this is in preparation for the second thing that I will be doing after this Okay. Check and make sure the stream is working well. Yep, we're working well. Stream health is good. Okay. Now I want to clean this residue off of here. And the easiest way to do that is I'm just going to use my alcohol. I'm just going to spray it on the board a lot. Let it drip off of there, get that fiberglass material off of there. There we go. Maybe use a Q-tip here just to wipe around it. Now, honestly, I could probably put these switches back into place and just leave this as it is, and it would probably work just fine. It would work great again, but that's not what I'm going to do. I have one more step here that I am going to do as a preventive measure. And if there's other people that do it this way, that's awesome. Um, I came up with this on my own <laughs> for what I'm about to do, and I really haven't seen anybody else do it. So if nobody else has done this, well, you're about to learn how I do this. I've never shown this in a video before, so I don't know. It's not really special. Nothing genius about it. Let me just wipe these down. Okay, get this out of the way. So what's the secret from here? Well, the secret is to apply a thin coat of solder on the tops of each of these. Yep. But you don't want it to be very thick because what will happen is uh, it will stick up too high. And that would actually cause the, uh, the leaf spring to always make contact with it. And you don't want that either. So the solder accomplishes two things. It gives us a nice good surface, conductive surface, for these leaf springs to attach to and touch. And, ultimately, it helps prevent that further corrosion from building back up on these. I'm not sure what these rivets are made out of. Probably just brass would be my guess. But that's, that's it. Just apply a little bit of solder to them, just like that. And then, uh, one other good preventive measure. Well, it's not really a preventive measure. It's just something that's good to do is I will get my deoxidizing agent. 
Some people say this stuff doesn't do any good. I disagree because I've been using it for years and it does wonders for me. It's just this brand by uh, uh, GC Chemicals. And it basically just smells like straight up petroleum, to be completely honest. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to wipe down the inside of the leaf switches of the actual leaf springy part. Just to remove any possible corrosion that might have built up over the years from those touching the tops of the rivets. Also going to go over the rivets themselves just to get any uh, residual flux off of them. There we go. Whoop. That would have been bad. I've spilt this before. It does not smell pretty for a while when that happens. Okay. Since I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and clean off the disc. I mean, it's not broken or anything, but you know, it's just got some crud and stuff on it. So I'm just going to spray this with the alcohol and uh, run my toothbrush over it. Just to try and See if I can remove some of that old plastic residue and gunk and grime off of it a little bit. Just make it look a little nicer. I'm already inside the controller at this point, so what's a little bit of cleaning, right? Yep. Dry off the rest. It's much cleaner than it was before. Now, this keypad is uh, kind of got some gunk and grime on it. I'm not going to worry about this just yet. I'll come back later to do a more thorough cleaning. But normally on this, I would just use like some Windex or just some, you know, just some warm water and detergent, um, you know, on a sponge or a light rag or something. You know, just don't submerge it. Just don't get it completely too saturated. And the reason for that is because if you carefully lift up, the actual number pad, you'll see that underneath it is a thin mylar film that's actually got little dome switches on it. And it's actually the very similar type of uh, tech that was used on Atari's controllers to activate the directions and fire buttons. Okay. So now what I need to do is to get these springs soldered back into place. And all I need to do is to just push them down to the point where they are flush again. And then I'll use something to just kind of tap on the edges just to make sure that I've got it flush to the PCB. Okay. And then just apply some new solder. And then I should be able to put it back together and it'll be ready for testing. Sometimes when putting new solder on these, the heat will actually cause them to pop back through again. Should work well. Again, a little bit more alcohol here just to clean up our mess. You see all that yellowish brownish gunk coming off? That's partially the flux from uh, from me putting on that solder just now, but it's also probably old residual flux that's already was on this board from when it was manufactured. Okay. 
Okay. Now we can pop this little disc back in place. Like that. Now I go ahead and I do a, a push on each of these just to make sure that there is some give. I want to make sure, because if I push down on one of these and I don't feel it actually push down and touch that, then I know that there's too much solder that's been applied to the top of the rivet and I need to uh, remove some of it. Because again, if you put too much, then it's always going to think that that particular direction control is being activated even when it may not be. You don't want that. So I'm going to go ahead and get one of these screws. To go ahead and reattach that center back into place. Let's just go ahead and back up. There we go. Oh, <laughs> if anybody was watching, they were probably screaming just now because they would have noticed I forgot something. Oh, good evening, Blaine. Great that you make videos going through the things on a granular level. Really helpful compared to the edited, summarized ones. Well, I mean, I suppose, but, you know, this does, of course, mean that, you know, something that really can be explained in, you know, 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes on YouTube, especially something like this ColecoVision controller that I'm working on right now, um, it does mean that it's going to take longer to go through the process this way. But, you know, you're seeing it in real time. You're, you're seeing it as, as it actually takes for me to work on it and do what I do. Okay. So yes, it's very important get those buttons put back on. I mean, I guess you don't have to for testing purposes, but eventually you're going to want to put them back on. And then to put it back together, you just have to take the keypad. There are some little pegs, some little posts on the bottom shell. With uh, There's actually some divots or some uh, openings on the bottom here of the, of the tray that the keypad sits on. So they just match up, line up like that, just kind of hold it down. Take the uh, top part of the shell and just kind of hinge it on like this and then start to push down at the same time. And then to actually get it to close, you'll find that you actually have to push the buttons in a little bit, uh, the fire buttons, and the whole thing will come together. And then just to make life easier, I always start with the screws on the top since that's where it wants to spring apart from now. There we go. That one. Get another screw here to put over here by the cord. I will state one thing though, Blaine, at least with the edited videos, you know, I have a better uh, way to frame everything in the place. I can, you know, obviously zoom the lens in a little bit better. Here I'm just kind of having to stay at a fixed angle. Uh, for what I do, because I just I only have just the one camera really that I can use. And this is the same camera I use to do all my other normal videos with. Um, anyway. Okay, so this controller is now back together. This fire button is actually being a little... It just needs to be cleaned up, but for now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little less tension on the side. Yeah, this one's trying to stick on me a little bit. All right, well, what I'm going to do is pop this back apart, and I'm going to go ahead and clean those side buttons up a little bit. Because what's happening is there's some dirt and grime on it, and that's causing it to catch a little bit. Again, I'm going to give this controller a more thorough cleaning, but I was just trying to go through the process of just, of just getting it fixed. Just get it working again for now, just to kind of show you the process I use to refurbish these uh, ColecoVision controllers when, when they're sent in to me for that purpose. Not everybody sends in their controllers because their controllers are working just fine for them. But uh, this particular one, uh, the individual who owns this ColecoVision has, you know, told me, hey, the controller's not really working very well. Can you, can you take a look at it? I'm like, sure. Send it in. Let's take a look. Okay. 
So it's this one here, and basically what it is, it's kind of catching along the top because there's some gunk and grime up there. So I'm just going to spray some more alcohol in there, get my toothbrush. See if I can smooth that up a little bit so that it's not quite as okay and what about the top Let's see if that helps at all. I'll have it quite lined up. Oop. Hold on to it steady. All right. There we go. I'm just glad that during preliminary testing, I was able to make sure that that fire button was fully functional and that those directional controls do work. Because again, right up front, that tells me that I don't have a problem with any broken traces or any uh, failed diodes inside the PCB. Although I don't know that I've ever really had one of these where the diodes inside failed on the controller matrix. I have had the wires go bad. Um, Similar to the Atari controllers, the, uh, and you probably saw it when I had it apart, the wires from off of the controller cable just have little crimps on the end of them. And they basically just slide over some contact pads on the PCB. I have had those break and go bad over time. And usually when that happens, I'll be honest, I go ahead and clip and remove that um, crimp connection that's on there. I don't even replace it. I just cut it off of there, strip some wire back, and I just solder the wire directly to the pad at that point. I mean, unless you really have to take apart the whole thing. Oh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's much better. The button's coming back now like it's supposed to. So. so now I will plug it all back up. And we'll test it and see if those controls are working properly now. Get my Atari Max cartridge ready to go. Get the coal USB plugged in. Yep. And powered. And of course, I've got to see what I'm doing. So get the RF cable plugged back in. So, yes, this is still an all stock ColecoVision. It won't be for long, but for now it is. I just have to wait for my TV to power back up. Just realized I have my oscilloscope probe hanging out here. I was uh, using it last night. Um, to work on a 5200 trackball controller. Yes. I believe that is a CX53 is the part number for the uh, 5200 trackball. But uh, yeah, I had I was using the scope to check some traces and check for some signals. I did get that trackball fixed. It ended up being one of the encoders was bad. Not unusual. Okay. Woo! A lot of noise coming off of that. The RF on this is not the greatest. Well, already I can tell that this button's working because I was just accessing all the menu functions using it. Okay. Up. <laughs> awesome.
up now shows and registers exactly the way it should. Right is working good, left, down. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, we're looking good. Both buttons are registering perfectly. Just like we would expect. Awesome. Keypad, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, asterisk, zero, and hash. Yep. This controller's working good again. So, awesome sauce. So yeah, that's that's really all I do to uh, to rebuild the ColecoVision controllers. Um, obviously, you know, in this particular case, all of the main functionality of the controller was still working, which is what allowed me to do what I did with it. But most of the time, I'd say, you know, nine times out of ten, or roughly about 90% of the time, I'm able to get these controllers working the way they're supposed to just by going through the process you saw me do here. Just get some good contact cleaner. Uh, again, I got a couple of different brands here. This is this can's almost out. This is the old, uh, this is another GC Chemicals deoxid in a spray can. I've got another one at the ready for it. And then I've got uh, some larger stuff that you saw earlier. I used both of those. And, um, and then the real trick, as far as the directional pads are concerned, the cardinal directions, assuming that those leaf switches are in good shape, I have seen those be broken and cracked before. And if that's the case, there's really not much you can do. You have to replace that. Uh, you'd actually have to replace the leaf switch in that case, which I'm not sure of anyone that makes replacements for those. I've actually just had to uh, salvage them off of other ColecoVision controllers, to be honest. I have a small stockpile of ColecoVision controllers in different states of, you know, disrepair. Some of them, many of them, I'm sure can be fixed and made working again. But as I've got like three or four working controllers of my own, personally for use, and uh, it's, I just keep them mainly for parts. But yeah, that's pretty much it. So yes, I know this stream was pretty short, but that's all I was going to really focus on tonight uh, was just to go through this controller and uh, get it working again, which we have done. So success there. There, that'll sit better. So other things that are going to done that are going to get done with this ColecoVision, but I will probably not stream all of it just because there's a lot that's going to be done. Uh, we are going to replace the capacitors in it. Again, this ColecoVision seems to be working just fine. I haven't given it the full-blown diagnostics yet. Uh, I did a small video on that sometime back where I've got a, a plug-in board that goes into the expansion slot on the front and goes into some pretty serious diagnostic checks. But at least game functionality, what little I've tested with this, aside from the controller having its issues, the rest of it's been working fine. The switch needs to be cleaned and rebuilt, but that's, that's not a huge deal. That's pretty common. Uh, but yeah, we're going to put new capacitors in it. Uh, we are also going to, like I said, I will talk with the owner and see if he wants me to do this. But I would like to install a set of uh, Ruggers Customs ESD controller protection pads to this thing. Controller board, or uh, ESD protection boards to the controller ports. That would be nice to, to install as a preventive measure. We're also going to be installing... I need to order more of these because uh, this is my last one of these on hand. But we're also going to go ahead and give it the full RGB treatment. So here is uh, my last TMS RGB board that I have on hand. Again, I need, to, I need to order some more. I think Video Game Perfection out of the UK is the only source where I can get these now. I know that's where I bought this board, hence why it's red and not green like I used to have. But um, yeah, so that's going to get installed, uh, and this will be using a 9-pin Genesis-style connection. The reason for that is because it will also allow me to install this. And uh, this is just a little composite board, much tinier than the ones I used to install. I think you can still get these from Console 5, but they're unassembled. So you're going to get all the little teeny tiny pieces and the PCB, and you'll have to hand solder it up yourself, which is what I did with this one here along with a few others I have on hand. It's not that huge a deal. It didn't take that long. But yeah, <clears throat> this will be to get composite. And because of that, I'll have to keep the RF modulator in place. So I'll end up having to punch a new hole in the back for the composite, or I'm sorry, for the RGB output to come out through. But um, I shouldn't have to install any additional AV jacks. It'll just be that one RGB port because that would allow use of either a Sega Genesis RGB to SCART cable, or you could also use 
a Sega Genesis Model 2 standard composite AV cable as well from the same port. And since I would have composite ran to that, that would function just fine. So by doing that, and that's another reason why I really like using the 9-pin, it alleviates having to install all the additional RCA jacks that might normally be needed. If the owner wants me to go ahead and do so, of course I will. It does add some additional versatility. Maybe they're going to take it over to a friend's house or something, and they forget to bring all their cables they need for it, or they don't have the, the Genesis 2 cable at the time. It's nice to have the RCAs and, get, and uh, be able to use cheap RCA video AV cables to connect up as well for at least composite output. So, again, it's up to them. And then uh, the last thing I'll be doing is installing, the again, another part I need to order more of, but I'll be installing the last of my ColecoVision Fastboot BIOS chips. And for those that aren't familiar, uh, the ColecoVision's a great system, but it does have this really annoying thing about it, and that a lot of the games, when you pop them in, it'll sit there basically on the game's title screen for like 10 seconds before it takes you to the options or before it actually allows you to start the game. So, you know, it's just this delay that the console essentially forces you to go through. And it's annoying. Uh, for a while, for many years, there was actually a version of this chip that had no delay. So basically, you'd pop a game in, boom, it would go straight to the game. However, that ended up being an incompatibility issue with certain actual released games like Sewer Sam. They needed that delay for some reason. And so now what we have available is the fast boot BIOS. So it's a compromise. Essentially, instead of having to wait 10 seconds, this drops it down to like three seconds. And quite honestly, by the time you get everything put together, you put the game in, you pop it on. By the time you've sat back down comfortably, the game's probably already up and running. That three seconds is really a, a no big deal thing. It's very minor. And it allows compatibility with the games again. So it's, it's just really good to have that. But again, this is my last one of these kits I have on hand uh, when I go to install it. And last time I checked, Luke over at Console 5 stated he was sold out of these. So hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully he can make some up on an as-needed basis. I just need to reach out to him and see whenever I need to get some more ordered and ready to go. Excuse me, I was taking a drink there. Okay, well... It's about a quarter to eight, so I realized this was really, really short. But uh, that's all I've got uh, for this little quick little stream. So hopefully you uh, learned something. Hopefully um, this will help you if you ever have issues with your own ColecoVision controller. And now you can see the process I go through, again, to refurbish these. It's really not that long a process. It would act, it's going to take me longer to clean this all up and really try to make it look nice again versus what it did for me to have to repair it and get it working again. But that's, that's how it always is, right? Anyway, thank you again, guys, and uh, I will uh, catch you guys in another time. Thanks, and have a good evening.